Good afternoon or morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Alex Beamer. I'm the director of band and orchestra here at West Music, and I'm uh, very uh, excited and uh, uh, proud to uh, um, be joined with uh, Rochelle Puccini. Um, she is uh, an Eastman artist, uh, clinician, uh, active performer, um, and uh, is fantastic. She's got a great clinic for us today. So um, without further ado, I know she's got a lot of things that she wants to cover, cover so I'm just going to uh, pitch it over to her and I'll monitor the chat. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in there. But um, and if you have any other questions, just uh, let us know. So, Rochelle. Thank you, Alex, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you for doing these things at this unprecedented time, and it uh, means a lot to to myself and to those that we're reaching. So it's very excited to be here this morning. Um, if you don't mind, uh, turn on your new video. These things work best when I can interact with the audience that I have here. Um, also, I want to get a good idea. Alex told me that uh, there's such a range of people joining us. I want to make sure that I tailor the clinic today to who's in the room. Excellent. Thank you. That's great. Perfect. I'm just waiting for people to, to turn on. And um, yeah, it seems like we have a huge range of people. This is great. Thank you. So of the adults that I'm seeing are, uh, put a peace sign up if you're a string teacher, band director. Yeah, great. Great, perfect. Thank you. And of the kids that I see, um, put a peace sign up in the air if you're from if you're in middle school. If you are in high school. If you are in elementary school. <laughs> Good. Um, if you have a private teacher. Good. Very good. And from the kids I'm seeing, show me with your fingers how many years you've been playing your instrument. Okay, when I see zeros, you, you started this year? Yeah, okay, you can put a one, that'll, that'll work. <laughs> a one is great. All right. Okay, if I don't see your video on, I'm not gonna be able to interact with you. So um, it's no worries, you can keep it off, we can do this, but I, I will tailor the clinic to whom I see in front of me and we'll work from there, okay? Since there's, there are a lot of music educators in the room, I'm gonna run this more like a clinic with some exercises. Um, and because there are students here, I think it would be a really nice mix if we get to see how these uh, exercises pan out in real time and we'll have the kids try them. Um, everyone here though, please feel free to grab a violin or a viola. Um, unfortunately, the lower strings are not going to work for this. So if you want to grab your instrument, please do. It This works the best um, like that. <laughs> I see a recorder in the room. That's not going to work. <laughs> this is for violin or viola. But that's cute. I started on the recorder too. I'm just going to give everybody a bit of time. And um, for the teachers I see, can you put a peace sign in the air if you teach middle school? Great. If you teach high school? Great. Pre-middle pre school, like fifth grade, fourth grade. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, thanks for this little poll. I, I just didn't know what to expect exactly from my audience today. So this has been really helpful. Thank you so much. So we're going to get started. I'm going to share my screen while everybody's getting out their instruments. Bear with me. It's always a little bit tedious going back and forth. So this is Shifting Essentials. We are going to take a tactile approach to finding the positions on our instrument. And this clinic is really perfect for all types of 
of ideas was shifting from very beginners who just started their instrument and who've never played before. A lot of the pre-shifting exercises I do here are going to prepare their hand and body um, to be able to shift all around. So, so it's applicable there and all the way up into the advanced high school uh, age students. So why are we going to shift this way? I believe in shifting in a, with a tactile approach because um, you will be able to reliably find your position on the violin or viola at any time. So that means if I have a, a way of measuring my fingerboard, I can find any note that I want all the way up without, you know, plucking to, to quick, you know, find, find the note and then come in on time. I don't need to do that at all. I've, I've got a nice measurement here. I can be in tune. When I have long shifts, I can shift to them uh, in the same place every time, you know, within a, a certain degree of error, of course, we're all human. But it really is much more consistent than if I just kind of, you know, move my finger to these positions. The fingerboard can seem very long and, the lo and lonely place. So we might not get to all of this, but it's built in priority. So um, this is just the topics we're going to go through. This is my favorite little uh, graph here, if you read what's going on. Um, that, that's how a lot of times I see students try shifting for the first time. You know, they, they get up here and they find their harmonic and then afterwards it's just a never ending <laughs> scooch up with the fourth finger. Um, I really, this, this little graph spoke to me um, as something that I had tried as a kid and also something I see students doing all the time. Um, it, it, it's so cute. And they, that means that they're ready to kind of go up to the next step. So we're going to turn all of this no man's land into uh, charted territory instead of just fourth finger land. Okay. So for beginners, for my teachers out there, the beginners need to move right from the very start. I know we all teach well for most of us some some of us teach in third position it, it's it's not really popular but even though it's a good idea um the first positions we play in are first position and if we don't do a lot of this pre-shifting exercises right from the start then what ends up happening is when it's time for the student to get to the place where they have to shift then their thumb is so concrete and, into this position and it's so stiff and the and the elbows here because they think that you know in somewhere in the back of the mind that they just are going to stick there they're going to stay there and then it's like oh no no we're going to move and then it's undoing all of this almost like the tin man with the little oil coming around and then they and then they can move around but it's always a, a little bit of a hurdle a bit of a journey to get them to move so by incorporating some of these pre-shifting exercises in your early beginning, even pre-playing, um, you're going to really help out the, the next teacher that does the shifting, or perhaps you're going to do the shifting. Um, and the, the nice thing is that these exercises can be done at any stage. So if you found, oh, okay, you know, yeah, I do, I have a lot of like, you know, ninth graders and they're really stiff, they don't want to move, or eighth graders or something, you can incorporate these into your classroom and it's going to get, it's going to oil those joints, um, so to speak. I'm going to stop my screen share and we're going to, um, the kids and I are going to do these exercises. And please, if, if you're an educator, join us on your instrument. It's, it's a lot of fun. All right. So if you've got your violin out, good. Let's go ahead and put it underneath or chin. And I'm a big fan of the testing. I love to test. It gives so many clinics on alignment. You know, it's my favorite topic is set up. I really, really love it. Making sure our head is on our shoulders. Making sure our jaw is loose and our shoulders are down. Okay, so once our violin or viola is in is an ideal setup, we should be able to actually talk and move our mouth. Okay, so if you don't have to say anything, but if you just kind of want to smile or keep your mouth a little open, just making sure that that joint is free. 
The next thing we need to make sure that we can do, I can't really swing my arm so well with my chair here, is to be able to swing the arm from, from behind us to in front of us. This is where I lose a, a few of you because you don't, you feel like this has to hold up something and you're having trouble letting that arm go. If we hope to get our arm moving all the way up the instrument, that arm has to be able to swing from the shoulder joint, okay? So just rock your arm back and forth. If we were live, I'd be able to come around to each one of you and help, you know, but right now you gotta help yourself. <laughs> and then on the next swing, we're gonna touch our nose. And then we're going to swing back again and we're going to touch our scroll. Yeah. I see someone coming around this way. That's really dangerous. So just come in front of you. <laughs> Good. Now we're going to slide on our fingerboard. And when we do this, the thumb must be really loose, like just riding on a tram. I don't know if any of you know the monorail at Disney World or the, those electric trams. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. They, they don't clamp onto the side. You know, it's just sliding nicely, right? Right on a track. And so that's what our thumb is doing. Yes, good, very good. All right. And I want you to slide all the way up, let the thumb come, and then touch your nose like we did before. Then get back on the tram, the tracks, and come and touch your scroll. See if you can go back to the swing sets. Yeah. Just a lot of mobility here. One of my favorite first songs to teach, and it's okay if you're old and, um, you know, like an older student, you're advanced, that's fine. Do this exercise with me anyways, because this exercise improves our left hand pizzicato, which is super advanced. I mean, we're talking Paganini here. It improves our vibrato and it improves our shifting and our fourth finger strength, which my goodness, even Hilary Hahn still talks about how she, she tries to improve her fourth finger strength. So this exercise is great for any ability. Um, it's a simple song. I call it the egg song. I, I don't call it that personally. It's, it's been around a while. And we're going to pluck three times on each string, but we're going to pluck with our pinky. And we're going to keep our thumb in this nubby area right here. And we're going to bring our elbow around. That's really important for shifting and vibrato. And it goes like this. Eggs, 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 flying through the air, air, air. And as I go to the next string, I'm bringing my elbow up, blending in the dirt, 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 and then final smashing on the ground, ground, ground. And as I've done that, I've used my thumb as a fulcrum as I move my elbow up and around. Let's all try. Keep yourself on mute, but I'll lead it again, and we can all play it together. It's okay if you're on a viola, just pluck along with us. Um, it's gonna, no one, no one cares what we sound like together anyways. All right, are we ready? We all have our posture here, our thumbs in the nubby. I know it has a real name, but I just call it that. And our thumb comes rocking up. And here we go. Eggs, eggs, eggs. Move our elbow to the next string. Air, air, air. Da, 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 dirt, dirt, dirt. Smashing on the, and this should feel all the way up. Ground, ground, ground. Okay, good. So that's one of the first things that you can do with a group of absolute beginners once they have their instrument on their shoulder. And I check in with this mobility at every single lesson. You know, as a private teacher, I see my students less frequently. So I'm checking in on the song every week. And, and you should do the same, putting in mobility exercises every day, making sure the students can support their instrument with their head in a relaxed way. Without this uh, pre-shifting, you know, criteria, then shifting is just going to be really difficult. You know, you're going to see lots of this and squeezing and such. So we're trying to avoid all that. All right, my second fun exercise to do is we're going to explore our harmonics. From the students who are here with me, can you put a peace sign in the air if you know where your first, if you know what a harmonic is and you know where the first one is? Good, good, good. Very good. Okay, so I, I see a lot of people know and some people don't, and that's okay. So I'm just going to introduce it. Um, it's actually quite a big explanation, so I'm just going to make it quick. 
a harmonic is where we cut our string in half, not with the scissors, but with our finger. We kind of measure the, the length of the string. It's about right here. And we do not push our finger down. If we push our finger down, that's not a harmonic, that's just a note, okay? The harmonic is the, it's kind of a whistle. And if you're fishing for your harmonic today, it's okay, just run your finger lightly on top. Do not push it down one finger. It can only be one finger. And you can choose whatever finger you want, but I think we should do fourth finger today. So, and you can hunt for it a little bit. If you get it wrong, it's, that's okay. No worries, we're all just, just hunting right now. We're hunting for our harmonic. And you see, once I found it, it just, it just opened up. Okay? So from my kids who are here with me, once you've got your harmonic on your A string, or if you're playing viola, your harmonic on your D string, put your peace sign up. I just want to make sure I give everyone time to find their harmonic. And if you're having trouble, go right there and kind of show you up close. You see my finger is not down at all. My hand is like in this fan-ish place. That's okay, you can curl your finger too. It's not, a, it's not a big deal. The point is that you're hovering over your string. And it just, the string just tickles, tickles your finger a little bit. Okay. Um, I, I think, I, I don't know if your name is Aaron, but your, your Zoom name is Aaron. It is much higher up here in the body of the violin. I see you hunting back here. So you might want to be a little further. Yeah, there you go. It's probably no man's land to you because we, you know, if you haven't shifted before, we don't, we don't go up there yet. Okay, so good. Anyone else? A little bit of help finding. All right, perfect. So now we're gonna take this one step further. We're gonna find our second harmonic. I forgot to mention that this pitch that's produced is one octave above our A string. So it's A. To get two octaves above our A string, we have to go to the other sides. Now, the coolest thing in the world about harmonics is that it's a palindrome from the middle. And this blows my mind because the violin isn't built like that in general. The violin goes up right in pitch. All the way up, it gets higher and higher and higher. But it's not true with harmonics. Harmonics are built on the overtone series and they are a reflection from the middle, the first harmonic that we all just found today. That is the lowest. And from either end out, is a mirror reflection, which is so much fun to find. So we're gonna find the second harmonic. The first one of the, we have two now because it's a palindrome, right? One on either side of the middle. The first one's gonna be easy to find for anyone. So all we do is we find our third finger on our A string and we're gonna walk up. We're gonna play live notes now. We're not gonna play harmonic notes for a second. <laughs> Okay, everybody find their third finger D, just normal, first position. Okay, once you've found it, I want you to, you know, only one finger down right now, and I want you to hover it. Well, it's not quite hover, sorry. It's, it's just a lightly touch the string. Don't let it come down. Don't push it down anymore. And you should have your second harmonic. It goes right above our third finger. I'm gonna give a little bit of time to explore that one. Yeah, good. You can also find another one with your fourth finger. That's fine, but that's not our second one, that's another one. So whichever one you find, it really, it, for this exercise, it makes no difference. I like the third finger because it's the double octave, but. Remember, you can't push the string down. That won't work. And you can't be hovered above it. You have to have it tickle your finger. Okay, now we're going to hunt for, the, uh, for that same harmonic, but on the other end. 
you're gonna have to hunt for it because we've never been up here before. So you're gonna kind of take a take a, um, a listen to what you just produced, and we're gonna slide all the way up and find its brother on the other end. And I'll show you kind of where you're gonna where you're gonna land. That's approximately where it is. So you gotta go all the way from here to here. And notice how my thumb did that. That's pretty much the same as how I play, actually, even though I'm holding my hands. I've gotten very good at demonstrating in front of the camera like this. <laughs> so I'll show you the back view. And then we pass through the one we found, right? The first one. Okay, so now we're gonna just have a ton of fun. I call this the, glissa the glissando game. And we're going to pass through all the harmonics on the way back and forth between this third finger one and the one all the way up here that we found. And it sounds just like the part in Harry Potter where the Dementors come. You know, when they're the swing sets and it's super creepy, you know, and everything turns cold. That's what they do in the score, I promise you. <laughs> Only all of the, the whole orchestra doing it at, at once. And then it sounds like way, way scary, way, way scary. So now we'll take an opportunity to go all the way through our harmonics. and just explore the sound. If you haven't got it perfect, no worries. The point is, is that we're sliding loosely because, and for you educators out there, this works because the student is not pressing the finger down. So you're eliminating tension in the thumb and in the fingers, the hands. So we're able to, to get them to move freely while exploring our harmonics, which is essential for intonation and um, you know, just getting around the inst and shifting. So we're pre-shifting, we're pre-vibratoing, we're, we're reinforcing our harmonics and we're getting rid of our tension. So everybody who's got violins, go ahead and just go for it. If you're a little bored with this exercise at this point, you can try other strings. Which it happens on every one of them. find brothers and sister harmonics on either side of the palindrome. It's so much fun. Okay. Um, if you've got your violin up, you can continue to explore those harmonics. I'm going to move on from a clinician standpoint back to my presentation. So we've really gone through, educators, we've really gone through all of this. The idea is that we move and we move without tension. I love to explain harmonics right from the start. The egg song that we did begins at the harmonic. That pinky is hovered over the E string and we're plucking right at that first harmonic. So the kids learn, ah, this is an area on my violin that I, or viola that I have to take note of. It's, it's really important, even though they're not gonna be playing it for sometimes years. Um, but then it doesn't have to be like that. You can incorporate harmonics into your repertoire if you wish. Um, or you can just keep it as an exercise. It's really not important that it's in the repertoire just yet, but that they are exploring this part of their violin. We don't want it to be too late. That's really the main point, that once they begin their instrument, they should have the idea that we move. We are not stuck to first position. Um, that should be the first thing that you show them, that, hey, this fingerboard is long, and if you stick with this, you're going to learn, all, you're going to go all over it. Um, rather than, hey, let's, let's just learn how to, to get our D major scale, you know, because I know that's a priority. And I'm not taking that priority away. We, we got we to get it. We really do. Otherwise, we're not going to play anything together. Um, but I'm, I'm just simply advocating that maybe it's not the first thing that we do. And we're constantly through all these exercises. Uh, again, the swinging elbow underneath was I call swing sets. I also have a pizzicato um, little game that goes with that. If you're curious, you can ask in the uh, question portion later. Um, it, I've got kind of a bag of all of these pre, we call them pre-twinkle in my world, but uh, pre-playing exercises. 
at every point, look for mobility of the left hand and arm, especially from underneath the shoulder joint. We do not want our students being occupied with having to hold the violin with this shoulder because we need it to be relaxed and mobile. And all while reinforcing setup fundamentals. All this can be done while you're working on the bow separately. So it's a wonderful thing to throw in at the game. Okay, confident players, pre-shifting. Incorporate, now we're gonna talk about how to incorporate harmonics into your repertoire. So I'm just gonna give a simple twinkle exercise because you know, it's, it's always in my head, um, how you might do this. And this is after, you know, like I said, this is confident players. They've been in your program for a while. They've, they're playing, they hold their instruments. Um, maybe they're not shifting yet. This is still pre-shifting, but we're getting closer to where we need to be. So you could take something like Twinkle where they would have studied normal. And replace all the open strings with harmonics. So. do this. Let's play harmonic twinkle just as I did. So we're, we're not going to worry about this, not the third finger and the super nosebleed one. We're not doing that one right now, okay? We're simply coming to our middle. So if the harmonics are new for you, go ahead and find your middle harmonic again. We're going to use both the A string one and the E string one. And they're in the same place. They just hop over the string, you see? Okay, I'm gonna go a little slower than I did in the little demo. Anytime you have an open string and twinkle, and we're doing A, E twinkle, okay? We're gonna start on our A string. If you play viola, you're gonna do the D, A one. And luckily, we can all stay muted, so this is not a tonal problem. <laughs> so, make sure you're all relaxed. We're gonna start with our harmonic here, and I'm gonna give an introduction, okay? Now you have just gotten your students to shift back and forth between really fourth position and first position um, continuously in that in that little piece. And it was fun because we love to make strange sounds on our instruments. And you can really mix that up however you see fit. So that's just the easiest way. Um, you don't have to do you don't have to do twinkle. You can take your existing repertoire, so you don't even take time away from your agenda, your curriculum. You know, I know you've got to produce concerts um, on a regular basis. So oftentimes, our our lesson time in, in classroom time is so valuable that we don't really you know, we want to do things as efficiently as possible. So it's no problem. All you do is find a few open strings in the repertoire, preferably longer notes. And you say, okay, guys, you know, put a zero on top of that, you know, and explain that a zero with a four or a zero with a three or whatever is the harmonic notation. And we're going to play our harmonic every time when we get to this point. Not only is it going to be fun for them, something different, and also a little challenging for the, the you know, more advanced students, but um, you can keep it like that. You, you can just carry on and do your concert like that, but that means during the rehearsal, as we, you know, as I notice, I go all over the country giving clinics and master classes into the schools and whatnot. And I, you know, as rehearsal goes on, this gets tighter and tighter. So if you're finding little notes here and there where you're getting them to, to, to stretch and to come up and to, to move that thumb and to get that tension out, it's a great idea. Um, so let me get back to my screen. 
Okay, we did the glissando fun already. You can you can explain harmonics. It's it's a so you're blue in the face. It's such an absolute fascinating subject. Physics classes encourage all your students to take physics when it comes along. Um, and elbow comes around. We've done this. This is the kind of the the continuation of the swing set that I was talking about. We come around. We can tap. Come around, tap, and the thumb moves as a fulcrum. And throughout all the games, check to make sure the hand moves as a unit. Now, there needs to be at some point a discussion of high notes, before, preferably before you start using them. So, you know, you want to bring out that music notation. Okay, like we have to learn how to read these. Can you identify? Can you read them? Um, just a little short, short spurt there um, before they need to use it. It's, it's always good for the confidence. Okay, the know-it-alls, they're ready for shifting. Um, at this point, we need to discuss what the positions mean. First finger goes where third finger goes and where, where it used to live, and that's why we call it third position. You know, fourth position is where fourth finger would have gone. Fifth position is where, if we had a fifth finger and sixth and seventh and so on, okay? So it's simply every single um, notch, if we had frets where, where the first finger would go and that determines what the name of the position we are in. Um, we're gonna begin swooping exercises and I'm gonna, I have another um, slide for this entirely where I show you the, the music, but what I, what I mean by swooping exercises is, but I need to explain how to do this properly. So we're gonna get to that. Now, this is a, um, sometimes this, this issue is, there's a lot of different opinions. Um, in my opinion, the importance of feeling and hearing the journey um, to the different positions is, is so important to understand where we are and where we're going. So in my studio, in my own practice, when I'm learning something new and whenever I give this clinic on, or master class on this topic, I always encourage the students to allow messy shifting. And, and I always explain why. And the story I give is that um, if we were all traveling to Florida, um, hopefully someday soon, we'll, we'll all be able to go wherever we, we want. Um, and you take a plane. Well, I live in just outside of Chicago and it takes about, I think three hours, three and a half hours to get to Miami. And you're there. You go from snow to 80 degrees in three and a half hours is magic. You can even take a nap. <laughs> It's delightful. But if you've ever tried to drive to Florida um, from the Midwest, it, it takes, you know, 24 hours if, if you don't stop to get down to Miami. Um, and when you drive, you have a new understanding of the distance of our country, how big, you know, what the states look like, what, how the climate changes. You really do understand where you're going. When you hop in a plane, it's just fun, you know, you kind of have an, a trajectory, but you don't really conceptualize the idea of distance. Even further, if you were to walk to Florida, which I have no idea how long that would take, you would have even a more thorough understanding of the distance and of our country and of, of, of all of the little nuances along the way. So by allowing messy shifting, we are getting such an in-depth understanding of our fingerboard. It's no longer this long and lonely place where we have to jump to and hope for luck. It's no, I understand this is where I stop because I understand this journey. I can hear it. So I always have, we're really going to get into that. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. But I hear where Florida is. Okay, great. Now here I am in Chicago. And I drive to Florida. Um, this is usually when I'm in a conference room and I can't demonstrate for you. So I'm going to pass over this right now and um, we're, I'm going to do it for you live. So everyone with a violin and viola, we're going to do what I just asked us for. My, it's not mine alone. I learned this from a lot of my really wonderful teachers. So this is a, this is a concept that's not new, but I find it's not a concept that's widely practiced. So, and it, it revolutionized, revolutionized my shifting and my playing. Once I began to shift like this, I had so much more confidence in my playing because I knew that I could get the note anytime I wanted. 
And that even if I was throwing up butterflies, I was so nervous, I would still be able to find that note and to play my best, okay? So it's going to involve a naughty technique here or there, okay? Something that maybe your teacher has said, don't do. But we're gonna just do it for the purpose of an exercise, okay? So don't tell them, oh, I went to a clinic and Ms. Rochelle told me that I can make pizza hands or tomato squashers. No, you still can't. <laughs> but we do need to do something a little bit like it in order to get a good understanding of our finger point. Okay, so this is how we're going to do it. First, we're going to find that D on the violin, third finger on the A string again by walking up our fingers. Viola, we're talking about our G here on our D string. We're going to all find it. Second thing we're going to do is we're going to now find the third finger with our first finger. We're going to slide up. Make the same sound with your one down. Good. Now, don't move. Keep that finger there. We're going to need it. Once you're up there. So, yes, this looks nice, right? I'm well set up. Hand is good. Here's where it gets dicey. We're gonna take the bottom of our wrist and we're gonna bring it up to meet the ribs. Okay, yeah, that's right. Now, when we do this, it is very important for you guys to all be on the right side of the instrument. Your thumb, I'm trying to get, I'm, I never can get a good angle here, Emma. You see how you can see this nubby area and my thumb is clearly on the right side. You may not have your thumb pull you this way. Oh goodness, this is just shifting death and vibrato death. You will not be able to vibrate at all. So we want to keep everything on the side. Whether you're a low thumber, that's fine, or you're a high thumber like me, it's fine. Everybody plays the way that's best for them, but we need to avoid that nubby and be on the right side, okay? So that means that our elbows are all up here. Remember, we're doing an exercise, so we're going to exaggerate our movements. So I like to do it in two parts. You're going to notice you're going to have all sorts in your classrooms or in your private studios. You're going to have the ones that start reading by context immediately, you know, and that's not wrong. Just let them do it. Um, we do get to this a little bit later, but I'll, I'll hit on it now because it's great. Um, when it's important to, to start reading exercises that move by, by step, you know, without a lot of steps, so that you allow them to kind of piece it together while they're associating a different finger with a different note. Once you're ready for them to kind of read on their own, then you're going to want to throw in some exercises with steps in it, you know, arpeggios, larger steps, whatnot, to kind of test, all right, is the student still reading by context? or are they actually reading the notes as intended? But give them time to do that. Um, oftentimes, I have noticed that in a classroom, a teacher would introduce shifting to fulfill a certain purpose. Okay, well, I know I wanna program this repertoire next year. Okay, it's got a high D there for the violins. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to get them up there. And so the, kind of the shifting revolves around that goal. I propose that you begin your shifting way in advance, even before it appears in the repertoire, and give them this time to really soak it up. Uh, I start my shifting like two, two books before the student is really going to need it, just to give them time to get around the instrument and to read properly. And then when they need it, um, it's like they pass through the piece so fast because they're like, oh yeah, this is fine. It's old news. <laughs> and it really is old news at that time. I like to keep my, my technical um, new things about two years in advance is when they'll need them until they get into the upper concertos and then they, they just kind of challenge me there um, as far as what they want to play. Usually they're violating that two-year buffer I have for them and they're like, oh, I want to play this concerto, I want to play this concerto, and then I, I just let them do it. But So D major scale. Let's go back to our classroom here. And it's okay if you do not know what we're doing. Okay, we're simply going to play a D major scale finger by finger. Okay, we have to find our D string. So in this case, since we're not avid shift, I'm, I'm pretending that the classroom is not avid shifters yet, even though I'm sure some of you are. Um, we're not going to get there by, by, by shifting. I'm going to say, okay, play your D string. 
Now find that same tone in third position with your second finger on the G string. So that means I have to put my second finger on the G string where my fourth finger was. So you can take a measurement if you like. There's my fourth finger. Now bring my two to where my four was. And, and I would definitely bring our wrist up. Make sure we're on the right side of the instrument. We've got a big archway here where our fingers are not laying down or sideways. And we're all gonna start from this D and just play along with me, okay? We're gonna add fingers in order. We are not gonna shift back, okay? So we're gonna do two, three, then four, then we're gonna cross to the G, one, two, three, four, then cross to the A. And I'll try to call out whether it's gonna be a high or a low finger, okay? Here we go, D to start. Third finger E, high four. Now we cross to D, G, high two, high three, high four. First finger on A, high two, high three, normal four next to the three. First finger, high two, high three, best friend with three, and we're going to come back down. No, now we have to pivot that elbow up. job good so you can introduce that in tandem with the shifting have them read it that's that's the goal um, ideally we would have all read this together if we were in a classroom right now give finger numbers if you want that's fine eventually take them off um, and always make sure that they have a way to start that is has a relationship so doing C major for violins, so they start on the G with the C. Well, they don't have open C strings. It's, it's not so great. Um, you can certainly do it with your violas or cellos if you're you know, doing that. Um, but but D, D is better. Okay. Now, this excerpt is taken out of the Introducing the Positions book by Harvey Whistler. I love these books. I make my students read both books. It prepares them for everything. I understand this might not work well for the classroom as an entire two volumes. <laughs> I, I really do know that. Um, so you, you will take excerpts from, from what you need, but you'll certainly be able to get to where you're going by, by using bits and pieces of the book. It's just wonderfully compiled. So this is an, a written out example of the swooping that I was doing. Um, as you see here, this first line is devoted to first finger shifting. And I always mention to the student that when we shift, we have to shift on the last finger that was down, at least as a modern player. Back about maybe 50, 60 years ago, it was really common to shift on the new finger. And that gave us that kind of old Hollywood um, Kreitzer kind of style. We don't do that much anymore. We do that um, sparingly, like as an artist might choose an expressive shift here and there. So that is around. But, but as an orchestral player, or even as a soloist, I don't really shift with a new finger unless I'm trying to make an artistic uh, choice there. And so I use them just a little bit, like a little bit of salt or sugar here and there, okay? Not the whole piece. So um, it's because it's cleaner. It's cleaner and it's more reliable. So that's what this book is all about, shifting on the old finger. The one to one to get the one. Here, this, this one is just our, our travel finger. Really, the, the exercise is between the one and the two, but they're showing us, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't go just directly to the, to the second finger. We go through where our first finger would be on the two. And then you see it progresses to the four. I played this line for you earlier in the clinic. Now we're shifting on our twos. Okay, two to two, two to two to three, two to two to four. I'll play it for the kids. The whole time I'm doing 
this, I'm hitting the side of my violin with that wrist that's coming up. That is super important. That is really the, the point of this clinic is to get them to develop a muscle memory for where third position is. And, and you can't do it if you're just going after the notes and neglecting this bottom wrist here, okay? So kids, I'm going to leave this up and we're gonna read from it if you can see it. Let's do this first one. And if you don't understand, it's okay, just follow my screen, follow what I'm doing, okay? Before we start this, this first one right here, <laughs> I was pointing at the screen with my bow. <laughs> of course you can't see that. Um, we're gonna do this one right here. We're gonna find this D natural first, okay? By walking up. That's the sound we've got to get to, okay? Now we're going to do, we're going to start right here on this first finger, okay? B, ready? B to D, play a D, play it again, back, down. Now we're on the second one. We're gonna go B to D, put our two down, one right here okay so we're gonna start on our second finger we're gonna shift to our second finger and then we're gonna put a third finger down I know we're jumping some steps here we only have so much time with you today so I want to make sure that we kind of get to um, some other things so we're gonna two, two, and when you come up make sure I can't see most of you anymore but Let's make sure that you bring your wrist up to the top of the wrist. And lots of swooping, lots of the, we want lots of that sound because we're not flying to Florida, we are walking. <laughs> or by car, either way, we are understanding the journey. We need to hear when it's time to stop, when it's time to go. Um, because a lot of our shifting in the wild is not going to have that, that mess. We don't keep that sound, that swooping when we play too much in the wild, unless there's a glissando going on. So when you're learning how to shift, now is the time to make all of those sounds. And in the classroom teachers, I always encourage the students, okay, let's hear that journey together. I know it makes a hot mess of a sound, but it's so good. And then, you know, like a couple weeks before the concert, you say, okay, no, we're going to you gotta get rid of that. Um, and you'll see that they, they won't make the glissando sound anymore, but they will be in tune because they understand the journey, they understand where to stop, the body takes over, they develop muscle memory, um, and they've done it in a way that is really um, mindful of like the whole journey instead of being like, okay, shift, and okay, we don't wanna hear any of that. Now is the time when they're young and exploring that. Okay, so this is, we're not going to play this. This is just um, some suggestions on where I would go in a classroom situation. You don't even have to take these, you know, verbatim. I'm sure you, you have, all have your wonderful resources you, you use, and you can kind of reflect on that and what might fit, fit the bill. This is from the second book of Wolfhart, where they do introduce their position. I like this one because, again, this is like, can, in, can be read in context entirely. It's long. It's in C major. So, you know, it's good for them. Um, and they've got some sharps in there and it goes back natural and just a few steps here and there, but it does get through the whole um, four strings. So something like that where they, they can confidently just read this down, even if they're not 100% reading third position yet. And then here's another excerpt from the Whistler book. And you see... I have, um, I talked about this journey of kids reading by context and then, you know, kind of knowing when they're actually reading and when they're just kind of faking it. Um, the student has the option, you know, of course this is unspoken, right? Because I'm just giving them the exercises and we're going through them. So they kind of have the option of reading by context. Here in the second one, I get the first glimpse of, oh, are, are they able to read that inner book? Are they able to read this inner book? Are they catching on to these? There's just a few opportunities here. 
And the second one's just, you know, broken thirds. That's by step. They could fool me, of course. Here, of course, my goodness, they could fool everyone. By the time when we get to 31, this is the, just a game changer. They cannot pass this by reading incorrectly. They must be reading. Um, and oftentimes we spend a lot of time on 31 until the student is able to read those, those intervals, those jumps to know where they really, really are. So I, I kind of put that as the you shall not pass um, gate up to make sure that they are reading the actual notes and not just all of this other stuff that contextually might have been possible for them to fake it. Um, and, and I don't chastise them for faking it. Like that's not, that's not a thing. You know, I, I certainly learned to read a lot of things by context. So you just be patient. Like, okay, well, if you're reading by context, start making these little notes of, oh, you know, my, my open strings, they're twos now. And, you know, be really encouraging of that. But, um, but then, yeah, you gotta, you gotta eventually throw them something like this. Okay, well, there is a fifth position portion of this, which I think we're going to abandon. Um, but I will really quickly just show you that fifth position also has the same feeling. And we've got to find that feeling. So we're jumping so many steps here, combining a clinic and a masterclass in the same session here. But we get to our third, then we do the same thing. And we take note of how our hand feels in fifth. Now my hand is right up next to it. No longer is it my wrist that's come up to meet the ribs, it's my hand. Fifth position is so comfortable. Fifth position is like, yes, that I know where that is all day. <laughs> and from fifth position, you can find that high F there. And then you can extend to that G if you wish. And then our harmonic is just a step away. So if you have that knowledge of harmonic, you can really get where you're going. I am going to um, show another slide, even though we're not going to, I'm going to kind of rely on all the information I gave you about third and have you apply it to fifth because it's really similar, except for how you would individually feel here, which is the swooping exercises are the same. The, the finding fifth is the same, except we're going to find it from third. Um, let me find my octaves. Oh, there it is. Okay, using 8VA to find your way. Um, at a certain point, this is advanced, okay? You might want to introduce your students to actually playing octaves and chords, which I know is not often done in classroom. <laughs> chance to work on tension which is lovely you get a chance to work on shifting you can only really do this if the, if the kids are shifting well now and you're really looking forward to like stratosphere type notes um and you don't have time to walk everyone through sixth and seventh and eighth position you know really past seventh position we don't really study it per se anymore we just kind of you know we go with it as violinists but if you can get them to fifth and you put a finger on in fifth, right? This is my fifth position. I've learned it. I've studied it. We're good. And I make my octave, right? Now I can find this high F. That's very high for repertoire. If I can find my harmonic on my first finger and make an octave, now I can find my high A. Now, if I were clever, I can take, okay, if I'm a student, I'm like, oh boy, I've got to get, a, get to a C beyond my A. Oh, that's so high. Right? But if I got time, then I can go, okay, my pinky is on an A. I'm going to put my first finger on an A, and I'm going to go A, one, two. And there's my high C. You see? And you can keep going, one, two, one, two, one, two, you know, all the way up. And you can find any note you need. So the days of <laughs> are over if you learn how to navigate your fingerboard in a tactile way. So to take you through this journey, kind of wrap it up in, in a neat little bow, we are pre-shifting. This happens right from day one, can happen at any time from day one in any classroom. 
I've done this with high schoolers. I've done this with five-year-olds. It, you know, all of that pre-shifting exercise stuff that we spent so much time on. That is really, really important. From there, introducing harmonics, getting the body to move, introduction of third position, have them feel it, have them practice the swooping back and forth. Exercise to read, exercise to play, feeling again, encouraging swooping around, encouraging finding the journey. Incorporate it into your repertoire, making sure that yes, there is notes for them to play in the repertoire that have those notes and that they, they can do it. Then onto fifth position, scales in fifth position, feeling it the same way we did third, finding a, a, a method, giving them a way to understand their body and how it interacts with the instrument. Scales, repertoire, all of that. Finally, try to incorporate octaves. I know this might be just not possible in some districts and, and, a, and a nice reality in some. So, you know, you just go with it. Whatever you have uh, in front of you, whatever programs you're working with, um, if you get to that point with the octaves, great, do it. It improves intonation, improves shifting, it improves knowledge of the fingerboard. And then you can start programming pieces with all kinds of notes because if you teach them the trick of, all right, well, let's say you're only able to get up to fifth position. Well, did you know that just by, by knowing fifth position, you can get to all of the notes that you need to just have to be clever about it. And then that leads to more and more uh, shifting confidence. So um, I'm going to turn it over to questions. Uh, yeah, Rochelle, uh, I'll jump in here for just a moment. Uh, first of all, I'm a, I'm a percussionist and I learned a ton today. Uh, you know, I never, uh, I've never gained so much knowledge on shifting. So that's, uh, that's, that's fantastic. I, I hope everybody got as much out of it as I did, because I know a little something now about how to move, um, up and down the, the fingerboard there. But, um, Celeste had a quick question. I believe it was on the slide, uh, regarding, uh, third position right before the, um, selected study slide is what was the material? Uh, that you were using? Oh, yes, great. Um, I'm going to bring up a, the slide citing my references here. Here you go. Very good. Um, and I didn't include the wolf heart, I see now. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to bring up that slide in a second after I give people a chance to right now they what they need to do i didn't reference um the collar book but that's a a real big part of my teaching um so all of that swooping stuff is it's a lot of what she does um i'm just waiting let me find the wolf heart okay i think yeah here it is Wolf Heart, 60 Studies. This is book two. Oh, here I've referenced it down here. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Just have to put it in the back. I've given this clinic so many times and this is the first time I've noticed it. So usually I'm in front of a, you know, a screen. Sure. Absolutely. I'm not looking at my stuff. <laughs> I love it. Uh, any, anyone else have any, uh, any questions for Rochelle at the moment? Feel free to to just unmute. Um, I think we don't have a, a problem with that here. Just just go ahead and unmute and, and ask a question if you need to, if you want to. Uh, are these available uh, for viola? It's the same. It's the same. Oh, are the the exercises? I assume that's yeah the question. Yeah. Yeah, they are. They are. Oh, I see it. Yes, here in the chat. Yes, they are. The same books um, are for viola. They're, they're wonderful. They're, they're really like the backbone of, of my teaching, um, especially the Introducing the Positions book. That's, that's a wonderful resource. Very good. Michelle, I do have a quick question, um, if you're willing. Um, just based on how you were teaching, especially the advanced students, you know, first, you know, finding third and then fifth, you know, mm -hmm. I was kind of thinking in my head, like, oh, wow, you know, maybe that'd be a better way to, to go about teaching the order of when you teach different positions, right? First, third, and then fifth position. But I'm just kind of curious, like, how do you approach that? And then, you know, where does second and fourth come in? And, and how does that all play into it? So perfect. Um, if we weren't combining um, types of clinics we had today, <laughs> I, we would have gotten to it. So I'm so happy you asked this question. Um, let me find the slide. Yes, here it is. 
This is my teaching order of physicians. Okay. I do first. You know, there's a lovely school of thought that suggests that we should start in third because it's more tactily fulfilling and that people can feel it. I agree with that so much. However, it's completely impractical. <laughs> you can't have any kids play with anybody doing anything. Um, so I understand why we as a community have just abandoned that theory altogether. But when I heard about that, I was like, huh, someone was thinking. I mean, they were. That, that, it's the same kind of notion of us starting the violinists on, on A and E. Well, we do that in private lessons. We don't do that in orchestra class. We start them on the D so that they can play with everybody. So it's just, it's one of those like, oh. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so I start first, obviously, because I live here and, and this is what we do. Um, then I go to third. Then I go to fifth. And I do that because they are the most tactily um, fulfilling positions and that you can feel. And once you have a firm root in this kind of map, then, then it helps everything else. Second position is a disaster. I actually feel that first position is a disaster too. And, and I can speak kind of candidly about that. I, as a professional, do spend my morning, like the first five minutes of my morning, just finding where my B natural goes. And I'm not even going to lie. You know, because we, we wake up and our hand, and especially for kids, our hands are in different position, you know, like you grew. I don't grow anymore, but you know, like muscles change and whatnot. So I spend time honestly doing this. Just relearning where first position goes. And I've been playing so long, you know, it's like you, you think you should wake up with this knowledge and sure I, I, I can play a B if I just woke up and do it. But it's a, it's a moment that I need to have with my violin to locate that, you know, because mm -hmm. we could be anywhere. We could be closer to the, to the pegs. We could be closer up, you know, one day there's, there's nothing that says you're in first position on our instrument. So with that aside, second position is the worst because there's really nothing there that says, Hey, you're in second position and you can't feel your ribs and it's really like floating in this long, long um, little desert. And I have no idea how cellists find where they are at all. <laughs> That's just endless. Um, so we have to approach second position with the knowledge of either coming from third or coming from first. And depending on whether it's a half step second position or a whole step second position, you know, whether it's like a low two or a high two, um, that makes it even worse. So um, I do that second and uh you know in fourth sorry and i do that with a lot of c major because c major just works so beautifully in second position it makes it all worth it because all of all of a sudden all those horrible string crossings that you were struggling with because you had to play in c major and now like oh this is brilliant this isn't hard anymore so it doesn't need to be introduced and i think it it should come soon but um i put it after fifth and then fourth is is not as bad as second because you now you have the ribs of the instrument to kind of play around with, but it's in between the two pillars of third and fifth. So, but it has the harmonic and it has the first finger on the fourth finger. So it's, it's quite a walk in the park. Usually if you've gotten a student through these uh, first, third, fifth, and second, you're kind of golden. I mean, I don't want to say your job is done, um, but if you're not the private teacher, you're done, you're good. <laughs> they, they can find their fourth it's fine you don't need to spend hours of like getting them to swoop and to find like third position this is where the bulk of your work is done sixth position and beyond um this this is just really like if you've got if you're doing the octave thing if you're doing the whole um starting a scale on each like i love this scale fingering you see where you start on a two Okay, now I'm going to do D major. I just start on my two. The finger pattern is the same, except you go up one more. You know, start on a two, start on a two. And this just goes up the G string. So you're like... You can introduce upper scales like that. I didn't play the whole scale, but you see it's the exact same finger pattern. You shift, you, you start on the two, you cross the G, D, you shift once on the A, you continue the fingers, you sh then you should do the remaining of your shifting up on the E string. And then consequently down the string for viola. So hopefully that's helpful. I'm glad you asked that because I, I, I like that slide.
Rochelle, I have a question. Yes, hi, Lori. How are you? Hi. Um, good thing. So I heard you talking about like on the on the fingerboard when you're telling them to have a loose like a loose thumb and and for the shifting. So I was curious, are you willing to touch it all just for a second on <clears throat> if a, if a student or a group of students feels stuck or feels tight, how do you well, how would you recommend introducing the concept of vibrato? Well, how do you even is it does it come with the looseness or how do you introduce the very beginnings of vibrato to someone that feels tight? Yeah, such a good question. I actually have a whole other clinic on vibrato. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in a nutshell, you know, um, the, a lot of the beginning pre-vibrato stuff is exactly like pre-shifting. Really, really, okay. all those games of loosening of thumb. I think if I were to get, like, you know, to your point of loosening thumbs that are like, maybe they didn't have the beginning of, of what I was suggesting of, you know, it, it happens everywhere. I mean, it just, teachers have got to get these kids playing. We are so first position focused. And there's no blame for this. This is just what happens. It has to happen. And some kids don't care. And some care really a lot. And you're split in 70 different directions. I mean, it's an amazing job that's being done in these, in these classrooms. So if a student has not had like all of these kind of beginning things that we focus so much on and they've developed a squeeze or thumb, which even if they have, sometimes they're going to just develop that thumb anyways, because let's face it, it's a thumb that wants to squeeze. Um, then I do a lot of tapping, a lot of tapping to check the thumb. So let's, we just take something as simple, like go tell it, Brody, you say, okay, before we're going to play, we're going to tap, tap, tap our thumb. I'm going to show this from the back. You, if you want to try with me, you cannot squeeze your thumb and tap it. And I'm keeping my fingers down, you know, I'm just tapping that thumb. <laughs> end on a straight open strings. <laughs> they can end on you know whatever but you're just taking like a pause you're saying okay we're gonna stop every four notes or when I put my hand up we're all gonna we're all gonna tap our thumb and you're gonna see you're gonna see a lot actually uh, it's a uh, it's quite eye-opening because some of them cannot literally play the way they're playing with their thumb in a loose position so you can see like them all of a sudden readjusting their whole setup like to accommodate that thumb. <laughs> and then you know, oh wow, this is, we've, we've got a situation here with, with that particular student, you know. So, so all of these things, th this just needs to be a part of every day, uh, really. From, from age five to age, you know, 95, really just, I do this. I, I find my body, I find where everything is, you know, every day. Like I was talking to, um, Elise, is it Elise? Yeah, Elise about just finding just finding my B natural. You know? What why why should kids think that they have to know how to play every single day what they you know retained yesterday? No, every day's new, they're in different sizes every day. It's so hard to play the instrument when you're a kid. You're growing like crazy. Um, you can't develop any muscle memory at all. That's nuts. So the tapping thumb would really help. And then the harmonic thing, uh, that helps too. Um, but ultimately, if they're, and, and I have another clinic on setup too, which we talk all about how to align the body, and it's my favorite clinic to give actually. But if something is off there in the setup, that's going to translate down the, the left or right arm, and that's, that's that tension. So oftentimes, a tight thumb is because they don't have their, their head on their shoulders. It's just, you know, out in front, and they, you know, you say, lift your violin up, and they lift it up, but then there's nothing, there's nothing to hold it up, you know? So there can be tons of things happening. Um, so it's important to get them well set up first and then loosen the thumbs and then all of that. But that was a, that's a can of worms topic right there. That was a good one. <laughs> good. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, it was such a pleasure uh, meeting you all today. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for the kids playing. Uh, it was a lot of what other better way to spend a nice Saturday. So thank you so much to West Music for, for putting this on. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, Rochelle, uh, the thank really all goes to you.
It was fantastic. Uh, and, you know, you know, I'm sure everyone learned a ton today. It was really uh, great to, you know, hear you speak on um, shifting specifically. So, uh, and uh, Cynthia, yeah, the question, any possibility of West Music sponsoring other clinics she referenced, you know, anything's possible, right? <laughs> Anything is possible. So um, I'm sure that if that's uh, if there's definitely a real um, want for that, we can we can work on that and figure that out. So uh, again, uh, we are going to I have recorded this um, and I'm going to get it out to everyone who signed up. Um, and if you have uh, any other questions, um, you know, I mean, probably specifically for Rochelle, too. I mean, she has her website, RochellePuccini.com. Yeah. I'm going to put that up again. I, I briefly did at the end. It's got all of my um, social media handles, uh, my website here. Um, as mentioned, I am affiliated with Eastman. Um, they do a lot of great outreach stuff, um, like they're doing right now. And um, I'm not so responsive to to messages on like social media. Cause sometimes that gets a little creepy with people who want to reach out. That <laughs> way. Uh, I'm just going to be honest. I, I just deleted it. Um, once in a while I find something, I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, I should really open that. That was a, like a, an honest question. Um, but my website, really people are very genuine about when they reach out to me via my website, um, for questions. And I always, I see that it comes in my mailbox and, um, it's usually very specific. Um, so not, not creepy. <laughs> and I, do, <laughs> I do, I mean, it's just the nature of Instagram. It really is. It's the what we're doing now I guess so but um I am very active on Instagram I do post like pedagogical pedagogical ideas there in my stories a lot I do post what's coming up um, now with everything being virtual even though I'm in might be given a clinic in Wisconsin or in Arizona one day or the next day usually all you can do you just have to sign up because they're like they're not going to say oh no you're from Iowa no <laughs> um they want you to to sign up and sometimes there's a small fee and sometimes it's free and whatever so i i do post when those things are coming up and what the topic's going to be and you would be able to then um just join in like we are doing right now so absolutely um well again uh thank you um rochelle and uh i will i'll do a follow-up for everyone um that was on today um and uh you know with that um ha have a great rest of your weekend and uh happy practicing shifting right okay thank you so much thanks much everybody have a good one <laughs>